Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Century Furniture CEU webinar, The Deconstruction of a Chair. My name is John Welker, and I will be your moderator for today's presentation. Uh, today's presentation is an accredited CEU by the IDCEC. And for those of you that have provided your IDCEC number, you will receive one uh, credit. We encourage questions throughout the presentation and we'll uh, get to as many as time will permit. Uh, you can type your questions at the bottom of your screen under the Q&A icon. Our presenter today is Alex Shuford, President and CEO of Century Furniture and Rockhouse Farm Family of Brands, the parent company of Century, Hickory Chair, Highland House, Hancock & Moore, Jessica Charles, Maitland Smith, and Cabot Wren. Alex grew up in the furniture business and is a third generation furniture veteran. His grandfather, Harley Shuford, founded Century Furniture in 1947. Alex is a knowledgeable and entertaining speaker, fluent in the lexicon of retailing, product development, and marketing to the luxury segment. He and his wife, Misa, and their two girls uh, reside in Hickory, North Carolina. Please join me in welcoming Alex Shuford as he peels back each layer of a chair to demonstrate how every component works together to create comfort, beauty, and quality for your customers. Welcome, Alex. Thank you, John. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I'm going to do something that uh, I feel comfortable with because no one is more than six feet around me at the moment, and I'm not at the White House. So I'm actually going to take my mask off, and that way you can uh, hear me a little bit better and read my lips if you need to do that. I'm going to toss it over here to the side, uh, my trusty protection. I hope everybody is wearing masks so we can get this thing under control. What a year we've had. It's been quite the adventure. Um, I appreciate you joining us this afternoon. Frankly, the summer was very frustrating for us in North Carolina on the manufacturing side. And that whole time I kept staring at a chair across the room in my living room, thinking that I just wanted to tear it apart uh, and get that frustration out of my system. So today, by, uh, by uh, public demand and a little CEU uh, juice, I'm gonna get my opportunity to rip the cover off this chair. I highly recommend that you tell your clients to all do the same thing and stimulate furniture sales in 2021. So with no further ado, what we're gonna do today is talk about the construction of this chair. We're gonna go all the way down to the frame of this and talk about each layer of it. But before you can get into the construction of a, of a fine piece of upholstery, first, you have to be concerned with the way it sits and the way the exterior is tailored. Every piece of furniture has its own DNA and in product development, uh, engineers and product designers are focused on the amount of pitch, the amount of depth, the seat height, etc. We all have a different body style and a different body type. So something is comfortable for one is it comfortable for another. For me, I'm six foot one. Uh, I like a chair that's a little bit more of a lounger. This is a particularly nice example of a classic club chair, about 20 inches off the floor, about 20 inches, 21 inches of seat depth, and a nice amount of back pitch to seat uh, pitch. So I'm sitting back in a nice cradle position. I always tell the customer, if you can find something close to the dimensions and close to the seat spring up and, and seat cushions type that you're interested in, go have a sit test before you before you order the other chair. Something similar can give you a good representation of what you're gonna end up sitting in. This is a spring down seat cushion, eight way hand tied, we'll look at that in a second. You can see I'm quite comfortable. I can spend the entire evening watching political debates from this chair, although I wouldn't recommend that for anybody. So, before we begin, let's talk about Taylor. One of the things you find at fine upholstery is flow matching. Uh, oftentimes I'll get a phone call from a designer wondering why such a little chair is gonna take so much fabric. Well, a quick lesson in how flow matching works through seams uh, will explain that. So this is a nice uh, smaller scale repeat, probably about 12 and a half inches on the vertical and about six and a half to seven inches on the horizontal. So that's the repeat size and it repeats across the fabric and down the fabric. At every seam, in order to perfectly flow match a fabric, I have to lose a half inch for each side of the seam. 
So if I was flow matching this, as we are here, you can see the nice perfect flow matching, I have to skip all the way to the next repeat in order to get this border. And I have to do that throughout the piece of furniture as it flow matches down and through the side skirts, etc. The bigger the repeat, the bigger distance I have to jump to find the next repeat in order to complete the flow match. And that's a term you'll hear in upholstery, completing the flow. Um, and as you go down market to less expensive goods, you'll see that they don't complete that. They might spot match all the way through, which allows you to save fabric, or they may cut, cut it random or cut the fabric as a plane, at which point there wouldn't be any matching at all. Of course, with a pattern like this, that would jump out to any connoisseur of fine upholstery. So, no further ado, let's remove a few pieces of this and get down to uh, brass tacks as it were. So, one of the most important and most unheralded pieces of the upholstery is the law label. And I have to pull both of these off, right? Just like a mattress tag, only to be cut off by the uh, consumer of this product. So I can go to jail in about 48 of the states. But I wanted to address these, if I can keep them in my hand to you, because there's one of them that scares everybody. And all of our friends that are joining us from California, we can thank you for this little label that we put in our furniture now. And it basically says, this article meets the flammability requirements of California Brew of Household Goods and Services, Technical Bulletin 117-213. And what that means is that this is an inherently flame retardant piece of furniture. But you'll note here that it is checked, contains no flame retardant chemicals whatsoever, because we build our upholstery to be inherently flame retardant. This piece of upholstery we'll talk about as we go through it has a Dacron fiber barrier everywhere that fabric touches foam. And that barrier does two things. It acts as a nice soft layer between the fabric and the poly or the wood, but it also acts as a smoldering material to put out any cigarettes that would be dropped or left on this piece of upholstery and allows us to meet California flame retardant uh, uh, requirements without having any flame retardant chemicals on it. We have no flame retardant chemicals in any of our furniture. The only time we would not check that box is if you send us a COM and we don't know the providence of your COM, because then we can't confirm or certify that the COM doesn't have flame retardant chemicals. The other one that I like is this product can expose you to chemicals that in the state of California are known to cause cancer or birth defects or other reproductive harm. Scares a lot of young families to read that. This particular product includes wood dust, which is on California's list of chemicals that can cause reproductive harm or cancer. So I can't make furniture without wood dust, and I can't certify 100% of the time that there's not any wood dust in our wooden furniture. So we have to include that message. Um, I'm a user of our product. My young family is a user of our product. We are unabashedly proud of it, and we don't think we're causing any harm but we do have that regulatory tag. And so be prepared to talk to your customers about them so that they're not nervous. All the contents are specified in the other one. I guess maybe the most important label in the whole thing is the one that says Century Furniture. So I'm gonna pull that off before we start. Put that here. So let's begin first getting into the back of this piece of furniture. One of the things when you see this presentation in person, oh, it feels so good. I've been waiting for months to destroy something. All of you, I'm sure, have about the same sentiment. What a year we've had. But as I cut through here, in person, you would be able to see the sheer pile of materials that I create as I go through this piece of furniture. I'm gonna try not to cut myself as we do this. <laughs> All right, there we go. Because part of the, the lesson here is these fine pieces of upholstered furniture are a little bit like a clown car. We put so much in them that by the time you take it all out, you can't believe it all came from that little chair. Because a fine piece of upholstery is about layering. Layering is that act of thinking through how each component works with the component below it to create the comfort and the quality that you want a piece of furniture. So the first thing you're gonna see after I remove that cover is you're gonna see this really downy snow white 
layer of Dacron fiber. This again is that upholstery material that will encapsulate a cigarette and smolder it out. It also acts as a replacement for the good old days of cotton fiber. Cotton fiber is a great product, except cotton fiber has imperfections in it and attracts and absorbs moisture. And over time, it can create that mildew smell that you find in old antiques. If you love that smell, highly recommend you go find the old cotton batting in old antiques. But Dacron is a superior product from a technological standpoint and replaces that need for just pure cotton fiber. Now, like every material that we buy, Dacron can be bought in much um, the same way as maybe a diamond. You can get a really nice, clear, perfect quality diamond, or you can get one of the same size that has imperfections and discoloration. And like all materials bought in the open market, they're graded. And as you buy higher grade materials, they cost more money. At Century and other fine upholstery companies, we simply buy the top grade of all materials. And why do we do that? Why not cheap out on the Daycron and just buy something that has more imperfections in it, is a little less pure white? Because I never know when you're going to send me a white Dupioni silk. And that little black thread and that trash in the Daycron is going to show right through that white Dupioni silk and create a problem, either out of the gate or down the road. You simply don't allow that. So we buy the highest quality material for every material that we purchase. I'm gonna pull this Dacron off. I'm gonna get down. Sure. Please. That's correct. California actually required the chemical for a while, and then at the same time, regulated that you could not include the chemical, um, which was an interesting little trick for upholstery manufacturers. Um, but effectively, the UFAC um, uh, compliant code, which was a construction technique that we'd used for years, a lot of you would have seen UFAC hang tags hanging off a piece of furniture, was a method of construction using a barrier material instead of flame retardant chemicals in the foam or on the fabric. And that UFAC uh, certification, it was a, an industry self-certified method, became an adopted standard for California and other, and other states in the union. So um, flame retardancy is still a requirement, but you are, if you're gonna use flame retardant chemicals, then you have to note that we don't. So I'm gonna pull this back up now. So again, the next layer we're down to in this back is a big layer of polyfoam. So pulling out the Dacron, you can start to see a pile growing. I'm gonna lift this big piece of high compression, or excuse me, uh, medium compression, high density poly out of the back of this piece of furniture. And just like I almost misspoke, I'm gonna explain density and compression to you. First thing we're gonna do though, is I flip this over, you can see it's specifically made for the chair. And one of the things to point out here, you see this little label on the back side of that piece of foam. This piece of foam was specifically produced for this chair and also specifically produced for this actual order. I can pull that up. So all of our poly, all of our parts, all of our components are specific to a customer's order. This is not stock. We don't have a pile of 500 of these sitting in the corner and we go pull the one off the top and build the chair. When you place a special order, that then kicks off requirements throughout our facilities and our partners' facilities to make every component of your order on demand, which is a pretty impressive bit of manufacturing in today's age. So, two things here. You'll see also the back side of this poly has a little piece of square poly that's attached to it. Right? So this is a contour patch. So this is allowing us to have extra contour and a little bit more support down the center, the spine center of the back of this chair. So you think about the development of this chair. As we were working on the comfort of it, we determined that we needed a little bit more center back support. And to do that, we brought in a crown patch of slightly firmer poly down the center of this back. And then we specified that to our poly supplier so that every time we could have consistent comfort and support. Now, density and compression. 
when people are talking about foam, you have two metrics that determine the quality of a piece of foam and then the softness or firmness of a piece of foam. Density determines the quality because density is the amount of chemical per square inch within the poly. And that density component, you'll hear 1.8 or 2.0 or 2.2 density foam means you've got more material per cubic volume in the foam, which means more chemical bonds. As poly is used over time, those bonds will break down. So if you start out with more bonds, even though you're gonna have some that break down, you generally end up with more over time still being in a supportive nature. So the inflection curve of how something softens over time with higher density foam, that curve is much shallower. Everything will soften with use. That's why you'll sometimes hear furniture manufacturers say, why don't you jump up and down on the cushions a bit and soften them a little bit? Because you're breaking down some of those bonds within the chemical uh, that makes the foam. But a high quality, high density foam will soften slowly, while a cheap foam will soften quickly. The other component is compression. And compression is the amount of pressure it takes to compress a particular surface area and volume of foam a particular distance. So if you have an 18 pound foam, it takes 18 pounds of pressure to press that set volume a particular distance. If you have a 36 pound foam, it takes 36 pounds of pressure or 64 pounds, it would take even more pressure. So the higher the compression, the harder or firmer the foam is. But the higher density, the more quality there is. So if you think about it this way, if I had two 24 pound foams, and one is a 1.6 density foam, and one's a 2.2 density foam, on day one, they both take 24 pounds to press them a particular distance, right? Can't really tell the difference. But on day 1,000, that 1.6 density foam, because it's lower quality, has less chemical connections, will compress with a lot less weight because there's less supportive material. While the more expensive, higher density foam will have retained more of its supportive power. So compression and density, little less here. High quality, high density poly back. Again, we specify for all our internal poly kits, uh, almost all poly kits are 2.0 or higher, uh, unless they're in non-use areas, uh, and then maybe on eights in areas where you're not going to use. Right behind that high density poly back part is another thick layer of this really soft and supple pure white Dacron. That layer is separating that poly from this interior spring up system. This interior spring up system is called a Marshall unit. Marshall units are very similar to what you would see in the mattress industry. These are individually jacketed coils. So each coil is in its own protective fabric. And then all of these coils are linked together with a hog ring. And this hog ring is, is put in place with a cinch gun where somebody by hand cinches with a basically large staple gun every one of these together with all the springs around it. And here's the unique nature. Just like I said, every material has multiple quality levels. Same thing just in a spring up unit. A cheaper way to do this is to put them in jackets, like these fabric jackets, and just glue them together. And if you were in the audience, I would ask you, why is it better to haul green? Well, if they're in little individual jackets and you're compressing them up and down, there's the possibility that one of those springs twists and turns sideways. And if it turns sideways in that jacket, now you've got a lump. And you may not have a lump on day one, it may take you three years before that spring turns on its side. And then you're calling back your manufacturer three years from now and saying, I all of a sudden have developed a lump in the back of my chair and they're gonna laugh at you. And we know that's possible, which is why we specify our Marshall units to be hog ringed individually. Cause I'm now going between the metal of the two springs and it's impossible for them to twist or turn within the jacket. But we don't do it just on one side, we do it on both sides. Those springs aren't going anywhere. They're always gonna stay in the position they're supposed to be in. It's a more expensive Marshall unit to purchase. 
but we do it because we don't want to ever have to worry about that chair failing on you at some future day. So I'm going to pull this Marshall unit out without cutting myself. It worked out more during my COVID time. All of us should have. And then I'm going to take that Marshall unit again, and you can see the nice supportive nature of it. Not every chair is going to have a Marshall unit. You'll find them more prevalent within the tight back variety of chairs, and not even every tight back chair will have a Marshall unit. Some will have sinuous wire springs here. I'm going to walk over here and grab a sinuous wire spring. And show you that looks like. Some might have a sinuous wire spring instead of a Marshall unit, and that sinuous wire spring would be connected top and bottom, and then would provide support as it's pressed on. And then you'd have foam, uh, Dacron, and other support materials over top of that. Um, and then others might have something like this. It's all, again, a question of how much compression and support we want in the overall back of a piece of furniture as we're trying to dial and come. Uh, pile that up over here. Now, below that, again, another layer of this downy white Dacron. And then below that layer of Dacron, We've got a nice barrier fabric there, which is kind of unique. We've gone belt and suspenders. And that, we do have sinuous. One of the things I want to show you with this sinuous wire back here is the way that these wire springs are connected to each other. You'll see that. That's how you really ruin a razor blade as you try to cut across metal springs. <laughs> so we're connecting all those sinuous wires together with what looks like a piece of cardboard. What that is is actually a metal wire that's been wrapped in cardboard. That cardboard is glued to the wire and then it's been cinched to the springs themselves so that when one moves to the right and left of that spring, those springs are supporting the one that's bearing the weight and that's called a tie wire. It's wrapped in cardboard to keep it from squeaking. Another thing you don't want to find two years after you buy your piece of furniture is all of a sudden it develops a squeak. Squeaks tend to happen when metal on metal contact is rubbing. And so that's why you'll see um, finer upholstery companies use those paper wrapped spring systems. Um, it's a good place to point out, this chair happens to be a solid hardwood frame. This hardwood frame part all of the parts in this chair are made at our case goods factory at Center. Our case goods factory, when cutting lumber, only knows one standard, and that is a standard good enough to go in exterior parts for case goods. So when they're cutting out voids and they're cutting out imperfections, they have that in mind. Those cut parts are the same parts that then also are built into a post range. So the interior solid wood parts in our solid wood furniture are exterior case goods quality wood parts, which is pretty impressive to think about. Now, not every frame in our product line is solid hardwood any longer. There are some really impressive materials coming out of laminated hardware or hardwood uh, that a lot of the upholstery companies are starting to adopt because they're much more efficient to produce, so much lighter touch to the environment, but also, and a lot of people are hesitant to tell you this, but they're inherently stronger. So if you ask me, why would a laminated hardwood frame be stronger than a solid hardwood frame like this? And I'll tell you, it's all about rigidity. So just as like looking at a, a suspension bridge or a tall skyscraper, a little bit of flexibility keeps it from snapping in the breeze. The same thing in an upholstered frame. That little bit of flexibility gives it enough pliability to absorb contact. And so in our case, and in most fine upholstery companies' cases, the only time you're going to break a piece of furniture is when you drop it off the back of the truck or run it into your door jam trying to move it from one room to the next. And a little bit of flexibility in a frame allows it to have the plasticity to survive that. If the delivery guys drop it in a solid hardwood environment, because it's very rigid, you get broken parts. A little bit of plasticity. Uh, is a good thing. We've actually had them tested at university and the testing proves out the same way that a well-built finger jointed laminated hardwood frame is a little bit more durable than a solid hardwood frame. So Alex why do you make things out of solid hardwood at all anymore? 
there are a lot of frames in our line that can only achieve their shape and only achieve the design vision by using solid hardwood frames. We also do quite a bit of custom by the inch and we find in a lot of those situations, the hardwood frames allow us more flexibility and customization. So said a different way, in every case, Dacron versus cotton, frame parts and materials, we choose the best technology for the needs of our product designers and the durability, lifetime durability of our customer in mind. As technology progresses, we're gonna to move to the best technology. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit in spring up when I get down to spring up. First, let's go through the arm of this chair. Oh, that feels so good. Highly recommend this as a therapeutic activity for everybody. Save money on your therapist. Just go pull a piece of upholstery out of your living room and tear it up on a per hour basis. Very cheap. So, first thing I did was cut off the cover of this arm. And I'm going to switch to the brakes for this. It's open. So when I pulled the cover off this arm, you'll notice something it didn't do, right? This arm didn't all of a sudden expand 25% in size because the fabric was not being used to hold the arm shape together. The fabric was placed over the arm after the arm was shaped by the upholstery. And so first thing first, pull the Dacron off the arm, right? And then we're down to the arm poly. Again, same thing as we saw in the back. This happens to be a thinner cut of poly, but it's a nice soft compression, high density piece of poly, which means high density, high quality and durable, but soft compression means that to the touch, it's softer, right? So this is probably about a 24 pound piece of poly. When I put my arm on that uh, chair arm, or when I sit on that chair arm, I don't want it to be hard as a rock. I want it to have some soft and suppleness especially in this English arm style. So I'm gonna peel that back. Here we'll look underneath it here in a second. And as I peel it back, you're gonna see below it, there's another piece of poly. Why, Alex, would you do that? Well, this poly is harder compression, right? This poly is probably more like 36 pound poly because the outside piece is about tactile soft experience, the inside piece is more of a supportive piece. We're trying to hold that interior shape. So as I peel that back up, notice again the production tag, it's gonna be upside down for you. But basically what that says is that this arm piece, three layers down in the arm of this chair, was made specifically for this order. Not for a random order, there's not a stack of them. It was produced specifically for this order. So pull off that piece of poly, I'm gonna pull off this arm top poly here. A little bit stronger, my He-Man activity here for the day. Wife will be so proud of me for working out today. And then I'm gonna flip this around so you can see the outer. The out arm of this chair. So the top of it, you can see, is a nice big piece of solid lumber. And dowed, glued and stapled together. And then on this outside edge, we have this arm, outside arm border. This is actually a piece of rolled, uh, non-woven uh, fabric. It's rolled in a very high density um, uh, rope. And that rope is then applied to that out arm. And why would we do that? Again, if we were here in person, I could tell you and show you, but on video, it's all about softening and deadening that outside edge. On that outside edge, we don't want people to come in contact with that chair and feel that, that wood edge. And so we're taking the effort to apply that edge rope. It also helps to build the shape. And I'm gonna flip to the other arm so you can see what I'm talking about. That edge rope helps build that ledge, create that nice gentle English arm curve to be able to roll back over down into a welcome, okay? So while we got it flipped up like this, Let's tear up this outer. Alex, while yeah. you're deconstructing this side, another question. How long have we been making pieces with laminated hardwood frames? Well, probably 12 to 15 years now. The industry slowly started moving to it. Um, in particular, uh, I would say, you know, probably early 2000s. Um, and as we started to, um, as an industry, move in that direction, we had to get a supply base. It was building 
um, laminate hardwood sheet stock because it's not the sort of stuff that you can buy at Lowe's or Home Depot. This is made specifically for our industry. Um, and you know, that took a while to get that uh, source of supply tailored and then having the right equipment and coming up with the right construction standards, again, to be able to produce a frame that was as strong or stronger than the frame it was replacing. Um, and I'd say at this point across the industry, there's probably 70% adoption in some parts of companies' products line to a laminated hardwood frame because we've all discovered that it's just simply a stronger frame that's more efficient. Uh, Another good. question um, on the same topic. Can a customer request only hardwood and no laminated product in the construction? Uh, no, it's not a, uh, it's not a choice. Um, so you can inquire if you have a desire to only have a solid hardwood frame. Um, and we can tell you which frames are solid hardwood. Most manufacturers would be able to do that. But I think you'd find as a designer uh, that your choices would end up being very limited. And frankly, you're going to probably end up with a product that, um, uh, that may in some ways um, uh, be a little bit deficient from a design standpoint because a lot of the new designs are coming out with some combination of stick and, and, and plywood. And there's actually, interestingly enough, a decent amount of molded resin these days that are going into frames. So if you get a really complex curving part, um, the strongest material you can use is actually a, uh, a poly resin type material. If you think about a very curved piece of wood, when it curves along multiple angles, it's going from long grain into short grain and the long grain. Short grain lumber becomes very weak when you cut across a short grain and you don't have that bond in the wood. And so you find failures in frames because you're cutting through short grain in order to make a big curved part. And over the last 15, 20 years, uh, molded resin parts that allow there to be a lot of structural strength in really compounding curves um, has been adopted. And we found significantly less failure in those curved parts because of it. So, uh, it's an interesting question to be able to request it. I think as you go to your manufacturers, if you have that desire or your customer does, the best thing to do is say, can you show me a list of things that are all stick uh, or all solid hardwood or are predominantly solid hardwood? All right, so is that- Alex, do you hear any off-gassing from the laminated product? Nope. Uh, matter of fact, all of our laminate, lam excuse me, laminated product are CARB2 compliant. Uh, another uh, California regulation is actually a nice one to have. Fortunately, we were already there ahead of time. And so that is rigidly and strictly tested. Uh, and so you have no uh, significant off-gassing from the uh, bonding material to put that laminated hardwoods together. Um, and that's actually a regulated uh, product on the import side and on the domestic production side. So it's not even something you really have to worry about if you're buying imported product. Uh, it's a example of government regulation uh, is probably good for us all. All right, so peeling in the work. Quick yep, question, sure. sorry, and then I'll let you finish. <laughs> um, are our screws stainless or bronze, or? So uh, that's actually a good question. Um, our screws, I think, predominantly would be stainless. Uh, I don't think we have a lot of bronze. Stainless is a stronger screw material than a bronze. Bronze is going to be a softer uh, metal. Um, but you also find that a lot of screws may just be simply a, a steel, may not be stainless steel per se. Um, as you go into an outdoor product, stainless would become more important. Uh, but the, the possibility of moisture getting down deep enough in a piece of furniture to corrode a steel screw uh, is almost uh, impossible. So you'll probably pick up as you see all the layers that you go through and get through this piece of furniture. And again, uh, we're, we're double dialed, screwed, and glued. And then also, we use a form of staple or, or nail, pneumatic nail, where the nail itself is coated in glue. And then that glue is actually activated by friction and heat. So if you go into an upholstery company, a fine upholstery company, you'll see them applying these, um, these nails into joints that have already been doweled and put together. Same thing in the uh, laminated hardwood frames. And those are finger jointed together, so cut out like jigsaw puzzle pieces and fit tightly together. But these staples or these nails, as the friction and heat activates the glue when they go in, that glue then re-solidifies and frankly creates usually a, a, a joint uh, that you're almost going to break the wood before you break the joint uh, if properly produced. So, all right.
good John we good all right no more questions at the moment I'm gonna rip the out arm off of this because I want to talk to you about ply grip um, and I'm going to show you on the other arm real quick because it's one of the most common uh, concerns in um, post pre delivery problems is that when somebody's delivering it and they put their knee into the out arm and they ruin a piece of furniture, right? Because the delivery company or the delivery person didn't handle the product properly and they need it or they ran into something, the banister on the way up the stairs and you think you've ruined it. Well, all that is is a material called ply grip, which I'll show you on the other side in a second, but it has bent open. It is bent open in the process of producing it and bent back closed when the out arm is finished and can be simply rectified in the customer's home or in a local workshop and not have to be all the way sent back to the manufacturer. Ply grip as a product looks like maybe alligator teeth. And what it is, is a strip of material where one side is stapled to the product, to the frame, and the other side is an open jaw with teeth. <laughs> and it actually looks kind of mean and this kind of mean. What we use it for is on curved parts of the outside or exterior of the piece of upholstery. We use it to apply the fabric because the fabric can be tucked into those teeth and then that metal ply grip can be bent back closed, hammered back shut. Those teeth grab the fabric in a semi-permanent way and then close that back up with a nice clean seam. And the reason we use it on curved parts is because ply grip by its construction, by the way it's made, is actually pliable in the sense that you can use it to move around curves and then close something up. In other parts of the upholstery, you'll see that we use, and I'll pull this down, you can probably see it, either a tack strip or a cardboard. And we'll pull that off the back and I'll show you on the back. But I do want to point out something here, just again, a little feature of high quality, high end upholstery. You'll see that this ply grip actually has tape on the outside of it. And it's got masking tape. I've ripped it open here, but if I hadn't ripped it open, here's a good example. You can see where that masking tape has been hand applied to the outside of that ply grip. What we're doing is we're bridging the gaps. Those cut gaps in the metal are what allows that metal to be bent around the curves of the arm of this chair. And by then taping it, and we do that in the factory, we're actually spanning those gaps in the metal so that you don't have puckers where those gaps are in your fabric. And it's a little extra care and attention that finer upholstery companies would take in order to make sure that your out arm and your out back um, is as uh, attractive as you intend it to be. So I've just knocked that open. You can see that ply grip again. I'm actually gonna make this a little easier on myself and cut through this out back. So rewarding. And I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna rip it out so that we can see the tack strips on the side of this. Try not to cut this off. Okay. So, ply grip across the top of this chair because there's a gentle arch on the top of this chair. And that ply grip allows us to follow that gentle arch. But then as I come to the side of the chair, this is a perfectly straight side rail. Side post, rather. Oh, we've actually ply gripped the side post, which is uh, probably because we're actually curving this way. You see the curve as we pitch in the back of the chair. We get down to the bottom of this. You can see I'm pulling out another layer of Dacron. And this is actually a nice material here. In the back of this chair, you can see kind of fiber fabric material. It's actually like a Gore-Tex material. It's a sort of waterproof barrier, um, slightly breathable, that we use to keep materials from migrating through the chair. You might think of it as kind of a dust cloth type material. But it also is a, is a moisture um, reduction barrier. So that's a nice little feature. I'm gonna dig my way all the way down if I can. All right. And I was gonna try to get down to the very bottom of this, but that may be more than I can rip off right now. Let's go to the front of the chair instead. All right, so we've talked about the back construction. We've gone through the Dacron barrier, or the Dacron layer, smolder layer. We've gone through the poly, talked about compression, talked about density. We've gotten down to the Marshall unit. We've talked about um, sinuous wire springs. We've talked about the 
a solid hardwood frame and also laminated hardwood frames. You've seen the arm construction. I'm gonna get down into the seat of this chair. I'm gonna talk about spring up real quick. Alex, while you were slicing and dicing, uh, do the same construction standards generally apply across all of the RHF brand products, such as Hancock & Moore, Jessica Charles, Hickory Chair? Every company has its own little DNA, uh, its own sort of unique uh, way of building things. If you think about a furniture company, especially ones that have been around a long time, they sort of evolve over time and they find the best materials for their specific product classes. So Century and Highland House, very similar construction standards, Hickory Chair, same sort of thing, uh, eight-way hand tied, but they may have uh, a different standard seat cushion, for example, uh, than Century has, but then Hancock has. Hancock and Moore is predominantly leather, so the seat cushioning materials they choose for their cushion inserts are gonna be a little bit different than fabric. In leather, because of the air release of leather, you want a little bit of a different type of poly in order to allow that to happen and be more, more comfortable, excuse me. Um, but yeah, we all generally use basically the same spring up, the same interior specs, um, and the same uh, poly standards, et cetera. Across our class of companies, we're all generally very high-end or luxury product classification. And so as we're buying or specking materials, we're specking with that in mind. Um, so yeah, you can pretty safely say, now Century does have a couple of different price points. And the argument we use in our price points is that at each price level, we use the best materials that the competitive class has available. Meaning, if you're making uh, a three series BMW and a seven series BMW, you might have different engines in the two, right? But they're both BMWs, so there's a minimum acceptable standard, but I can't put a V12 engine in a three series BMW. Now the engine that's in it is a fabulous engine and it's going to last you your entire driving life with that car, and you're gonna be proud of it. But there is a reason that you step up to a five series and a seven series. Hope that helps, it's a little vague, but without getting into a real technical chart of uh, comparison. So, first thing I did was I cut open the seat. So, the cushion is a seat cushion. The seat, in the parlance of upholstery, is the upholstery below the cushion. So, we call this the seat. So, I've cut open the seat border here. You can see it's a miter sewn seat border. And I go to lift it up. One of the first things you can see is I can't lift the whole seat up. That's because that seat is actually hand laced down into place. I'm gonna reach in here and I'm gonna cut the twine that's been put in place by hand to lace that seat down. And I'm gonna rip that seat up so you get a little bit more access to it. You can see that's hand stitched down in order to create that nice seat border. And then the first thing I'm gonna pull out of there is a big piece of, of downy white Dacron. And then below that is a layer of bonded Dacron. Bonded Dacron is the same material, but with sizing and heat, it's been bonded into more of a sheet instead of what um, pure Dacron is, which is almost like a, a raw cotton kind of look. So bonded sheet stock and then Dacron prior to bonding. And then below that, I have an edge rope. Now, this is a closed cell foam, contour extruded edge profile. Lift this off so you can see it. And I'm actually going to rip it in half so you can kind of see the edge profile. So this little ledge at the bottom sits on the edge wire. The rounded front bull of it provides that uh, front edge uh, shape and profile and also gives you a soft material so you don't feel that edge wire. So this happens to be, and those are all hog ringed into place. Old southern term, I suppose. Um, and this happens to be a spring edge chair. So this front edge is all sprung up. I'm gonna rip into that here in just a second. But I gotta cut a little bit further back in the seat. My wife knew I was doing this today. Maybe promise not to end up in the emergency room. Keeping my promise. Okay. Underneath that seat denim, and this is a twill type product. Uh, that's a cotton, woven cotton product. Um, and underneath that is a layer of trim pad or deck pad. The deck pad is also made of Dacron, but where the loose Dacron, very loose, 
the bonded Dacron um, is a little bit tighter. This is high density bonded under heat and sizing. So it creates a really nice supportive material to put right on top of the springs so you don't feel or see those springs in the seat. Again, if you were keeping track, that's the third layer before I've even gotten to the springs. Now, the springs themselves are encapsulated in a product called Propex. Propex is effectively the same material they make trampolines out of. So very durable, also almost no stretch to it. So it holds everything nicely into place. I'm gonna cut into this Propex. It's kind of like cutting into a trampoline. It's kind of tough. Don't want those springs to ever trude out. And as I cut through it, now down to the eight-way hand-tied spring system. Now I mentioned earlier that we're constantly adopting technology that we think is better for the construction of a piece of upholstery than what came before. We still eight-way hand-tie our furniture even though there are other options out there, machine tied coil units, uh, you know, uh, big steel curving metal straps, you name it. I've even seen somebody try to pitch me on a waterbed type unit. But the bottom line is no one's invented a better spring up system than eight way hand tied seat construction yet. When they do, we'll look at it. So far, hasn't happened. So as we look at the spring up unit, Eight-way hand tying is very simple. It is what we say it is, which is springs that are tied together as a unit eight times. So there are eight knots around the spring unit. Each knot ties that spring to the spring next to it. So the entire tribe, the entire community of springs is supporting each other. It'd be nice if we could do that a little bit more. As I press down on this center spring, the springs to the left, right, north, and south of it are supporting that center spring. This is a waxed twine, so the waxed twine, as you knot it, doesn't slip. The wax keeps it from slipping, and an individual in our factory ties every single one of these knots under pressure. And as Comer, my videographer, watches, I'm actually going to cut this center spring out, and you're going to see that it'll actually lift up. That spring, as it lifts up, when it's sprung up, the whole spring up system is sprung under pressure. We're not just tying across the top of that. Now, I'm gonna go lift that spring out. Oh, I can't. Now, in a lot of upholstery companies, and even in some of our product lines, you would take the bottom of that spring and it would be attached to webbing down below. It would be cinch clamped to the webbing or it would be laced through the webbing. In our upper end product, in our, in our signature five-star product, we use a product called Neversag. And these are the Neversag straps down here in the bottom of this chair. And what Neversag is, is actually a steel strap that's been dipped in glue and wrapped in cardboard and then pressed so that it has a sine wave type pattern to it. And what that sine wave pattern allows, with Cone following me over here, sorry to move so quickly. That sine wave pattern, which you can see on the profile here, allows us to actually lace the spring right into the steel strap. And so it's actually twisted into place with the spring connecting with the steel strap in multiple places. So what does that mean? Why is it important for me? Why is it better? Well, if you ever go to an upholstery store, or even in your own furniture world, you start to hear a clicking in the bottom of your piece of furniture after about 10 years, it's probably because the bottom of that spring has come loose from the webbing and as it's being compressed up and down with use, the bottom of the spring is clicking against the metal next to it. You're not gonna be able to get this spring to move out the bottom of this chair unless you're able to twist it 360 degrees out of that wire material. And since it's tied eight ways to the, the ones next to it, there's no way to twist it, no way to pull it out. You're never gonna have a failure of spring in the bottom of this chair. The steel straps are called never sag because unlike webbing or jute, they're never going to sag, it's steel. So when you go to an antique store, one of the things you do is when you sit in an old antique, it feels like you're sitting in a bucket. The springs have not failed. The bottom of that chair has sagged out because natural jute will over time stretch a little bit. The steel springs, steel straps here will never, never stretch. So you don't get that bucketing effect or that failure of the spring up system.
The other thing you'll see about the screen is it's shaped like an hourglass. And raise your virtual hands if you know why it's shaped like an hourglass. Let's see everybody doing this. It's shaped like an hourglass so that when it's compressed, the metal never touches itself. There's no noise caused by that spring compressing because the hourglass shape keeps the metal away from itself. Nice little feature. Uh -huh. Question for Please. you. So this guest says this information is so extensive, how long does it take to complete a chair like this? <laughs> That's a very good question. So um, the number of hours in the production of this chair in our facility uh, is north of 20 hours of man labor in this chair. But that doesn't really tell the story because that's just our part of pulling this together, right? There are hours within the spring at the spring factory. There are many hours within the fabric at the fabric factory and at the poly factory and at the seat cushion factory. All the way through, if you were to add the number of hours to the entire life of this from raw material all the way to finished chair across all the suppliers in our network that support us, it's hundreds of hours. Uh, it's always amazing to me that it can be sold as inexpensively as it's sold. Um, but just within the uh, area of our factory alone, there'll be over 20 hours in the make, making of this chair. So pretty impressive bit of, uh, of work, hand work that goes into it. So I want to come down here real quick. We're going to look at the front of this spring up um, because this chair is a little bit unique. You don't see as many um, soft edge or wire edge chairs or sofas out there anymore. And there's a lot of uh, misconceptions about why that is. And I'll talk about it in a second. But one of the things you're going to see here is this front spring has this protruding lip that sticks out. That front spring is very different than this spring. I'm actually going to grab one over here while Cody shows you the chair. And I'll explain why that is. So that front spring has a ledge that's built into the spring. This ledge hangs forward so it can hang over the front rail of the chair and provide the support for the wire edge that's on the front. This chair also has a small spring that sits on top of the corner block right over the foot. That small spring which is shorter than the standard springs, is meant exactly for that purpose. And then, last but not least, this chair, we actually have a double small spring here, but in other styles, you might use a butterfly spring, a butterfly spring like this, again, to sit and support that edge wire and stay out of the way. So you can have as many as four or five different types of springs just in the seat construction here. And each one is created by spec. So our spring up uh, craftspeople are in their own right craftspeople. They have to know which springs to pull, know where they're placed, be able to tie them under tension at the proper height, keep it level, and do it in a timely manner. Uh, it's truly an art in its own right. Um, so this wire that runs across the front of this chair also extends all the way around the side and the back of this chair. That wire ties the entire unit together on the outside and each place where it crosses a spring is clamped or cinch clamped into place to the spring itself, um, allowing this entire unit to be very contained and act as one support system. Kind of a neat piece of engineering, if you will. Um, if you ever really want to try yourself, uh, your hand at something difficult, come to Hickory and I'll put you in spring up for about an hour and let you do this. And either your arms will get big quickly or you'll yell mercy and decide that that's not a job that you can do eight hours a day, five days a week. These guys are very good uh, at what they do and you don't want to arm wrestle flip that way. I'm gonna flip this up real quick. The bottom of this chair has a dust cover. So traditionally, historically, dust covers were intended for exactly that purpose, to collect all the horse hair, and rubberized hog hair and moss particles that were falling out of your chair because those were the upholstery materials, right? It was moss and cotton and horse hair and hog hair, and you didn't want that on your floor, so you had a dust cover on the bottom. We use a dust cover these days not because any dust is ever going to fall out of this chair, but because it's nice to tie it all together and make a pretty base to it. This dust cover, pull it down. I'm just going to go through this other one because I want to show you that never sag from below. So you can see those steel straps. 
here that are supporting the bottom of those springs. Okay? Now, a couple other things we want to go through real quick. I'm trying to be conscious of y'all's time. I'm going to pull this skirt off. And I mentioned uh, earlier why you don't see as many softer spring edge pieces of furniture anymore. So the misnomer is, oh, well, everybody's trying to produce less expensive product. That's not the case at all. You'll see the length of this skirt is about six inches, which used to be very prevalent 20 years ago. Lots of six inch kick pleat skirts all over the industry. Skirts need to be stapled to wood. And in order to staple a skirt that's taller than six and a half inches, I need to run that wood higher. And the design of upholstery has moved to longer and longer skirts. They look very elegant, very nice, and waterfall skirts that are deck hung. And if you use a spring edge for a tall skirt, every time you sit on it, that skirt drags the floor, drags the floor, drags the floor. Mm -hmm. And you also have no wood to staple to. So as skirts got longer, we lost spring edges as an industry. Spring edge is nice. I like them. Do I have any in my house? I don't. <laughs> so, and you know, uh, it's one of those um, design changes that caused a construction change. Right, so I'm going to pull this skirt off real quick. I'm going to talk. Get it off about skirt construction. So skirts are their own science, right? A skirt is a balance for all of you designers who also do window treatments. Balances uh, are exactly the same construction as skirts. Um, so we're basically hanging a window treatment off the bottom of every chair and sofa that has a skirt. And this skirt, lined with denim, box mitered, and you can see the seam along the bottom. And then we actually take a little strip of the face fabric and we sew it to the back side of the skirt. So that if the fabric or the denim ever stretches at different rates, you aren't seeing denim hanging out below your skirt. That face fabric would be what's showing, not the denim. Inside of that skirt, we've got a pellon material. So it's basically a stiffener, right? That gives it body. And then you also see zinc drapery weights that are applied to that skirt. Just like window treatments. If anybody, again, has experience in window treatments, you know drapery weights are used to allow gravity to help those draperies settle down and have a nice hang. Same thing with the skirt. We're trying to get a good hang out of that skirt. Skirt blocks, individually lined again in denim. So you can see our skirt block over here, also nicely lined. And when I lift that skirt up, there's something you don't see underneath the skirt of our signature product. You don't see any staples. So we're actually closing the entire area underneath the skirt with a denim, so you see nothing but sort of pretty tailoring all the way through. This chair. Alex, yep. Oh, Sorry. So when budget is limiting, what are your non-negotiable elements with designers and or what affordable elements is are surprisingly impactful <laughs> on quality, comfort, or durability? Well, so I would tell you um, typically seat cushion uh, and at the high end with us or, or really any other vendor you're dealing with at the high end, the standard seat cushion they're picking is usually very good for the piece of furniture you're purchasing. So there's not a lot of need to switch seat cushion, but I do think that's an area that if you're looking for a play square, taking money out or putting the money in to make a big difference, seat cushion's a big one, seat and back cushion. Uh, I'm particular to uh, spring down, which is why it's standard in all of our upper room furniture at Century and, and across a lot of our brands, uh, and fiber down backs. I'm not a big fan of all down backs. I'm not a big fan of all down seats. They take too much maintenance, but 50-50 fiber down is a particularly nice product to give you resiliency and comfort. Uh, the other thing that I'm pretty particular about is eight-way hand tie. So I'd look for that eight-way hand tie um, uh, component and then frankly, like uh, here, you know, wrapping the bottom underneath the skirt and denim so you don't see any staples, that's gilding a little. How often are you really gonna lift a skirt to see that? Not very often. It's awful nice to have in your, you know, highest end uh, Mercedes Benz, but that's a, a sort of a feature that's not a critical feature. Um, I do think that uh, a fine finish is something that really uh, can hold up over time and bring value to a piece of upholstery. So uh, companies that put more steps in their finish is a big thing. Um, and then the biggest one, and designers don't always like to hear this, is fabric. The discrepancy in fabric price from the $35, $40 fabric that's out there to the $240 fabric is... Um, 
the construction is not always the thing that makes that discrepancy prevalent. You can find some very good $35, $40 fabrics that will hold up and be beautiful and are supple and are great. And that $240 a yard fabric, if you're on a budget with your client, while it may be just the thing, there are probably other options that can save you a lot of money. It's often the case in our upholstery that the fabric sent to us by a designer costs more than the piece of furniture. So the first thing I would say is use fabric as your ability to tailor it to the, design, to the client's price point. Um, if the client has unlimited budget, there are fabrics in the upper end uh, at, at high prices that are absolutely fabulous. But it's not a huge drop down in quality of look to get a whole lot of bang for your buck down in that $30, $40, $50 a yard variety. So just wanted to point out real quickly, this chair happens to be standard with casters. Those are solid brass casters. We finish all our legs um, with, uh, in a spray booth. So none of these are dipped in uh, buckets of paint. These are actually all multi-step hand sprayed finishes. Um, and then I'm gonna flip this up real quick because I know we're out of time and I want to show you the seat cushion before we're done. Um, the seat cushion on this chair is its own piece of art. Um, so I'm going to zip off the cover real quick. If you think about it, as I take this off, I'm taking off a very nice um, sewn shirt. So the seat cushion alone, if you were to go out and buy this at, uh, you know, at a fine apparel store, would be worth $80 to $100 just on its own. And I'm getting to the interior of that seat cushion. The first thing you see is downproof ticking. So downproof ticking uh, is a cotton poly blend. It's woven so tightly that the, the posts or the quills of the feather can't go through the weave. And that is, you'll hear in the term in the industry, DPT, which just stands for downproof ticking. And you can buy this at a lot of different quality levels again. Cheap downproof ticking is going to allow a lot of feather migration. You're going to get feathers coming out of this cushion. You know, you're always going to get a few, even with the finest material. Sometimes the feathers just find their way out of jail and they get loose. But as you go cheaper, you're going to have a lot more of that. DPT also, because of that tight weave, releases air slowly. So when you sit in it, it gives you that nice, comfortable ease of compression. Um, so I'm going to, you see here, made specifically for the chair. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this up without, I'm going to be very careful because this cushion is filled with down and I don't want a feather storm in my showroom a few days before market. All right. All right. Now, as I pull this outside jacket off, underneath here, you'll see that same production label. This seat cushion was made specifically for this order. When we have an order that comes in for you or your client, every component is made for her or him specifically. That's what those labels are, unique and specific to this. Now I'm gonna pull this jacket off the exterior. This happens to be a spring down seat cushion, which is standard at our upper end and our sentry line. And inside of that is this down jacket. And this is literally feather down blend that's been channeled into the back of the jacket and channeled into the top of the jacket. The whole thing sewn with a border. This interior material is a breathable material. It's kind of like that dust body because it wants to let the air into the seat. The outside is downproof ticking. This is effectively a nice north face jacket which would cost you two or three hundred dollars at the local North Face store or Canadian Goose or wherever you like to shop. We're including this with your purchase price of our fine upholstery and most high-end companies are also. Down is a fabulous material for seating construction. It does take maintenance. Your customer needs to know that there'll be a little bit of maintenance. But inside that down jacket, we have our high density poly core. The outside of this is wrapped in Dacron. And we do that for a very simple reason. There is an edge to this poly, a sharp edge. We don't want that sharp edge telegraphing through the seat cushion. So we wrap the entire thing in a poly, uh, uh, compressed poly or bonded Dacron material in order to kill that edge. And then inside of it is our Marshall units again, right? High density foam, the inside of which is a Marshall unit 
And just like I said earlier, individually hog clamped Marshall unit springs on both sides can be purchased much cheaper. We can get the springs cheaper. We can get the poly cheaper. We can get the down cheaper. We can get cheaper down proof ticking. We can get cheaper springs. We can get cheaper Datron. We can get cheaper lumber. We can get cheaper people. But you're not buying cheaper furniture. You're buying high-end designer level product. And each one of these components together builds up a high quality, long living piece of comfortable upholstery that there's no substitute for. When you buy it right and understand what's inside of it, then it's gonna give you a lifetime of, of joy and value. So if you can see the pile of mess that I've made here, you can tell that I'm gonna be very relaxed this evening. I'm gonna enjoy myself quite a bit this afternoon because I've gotten all my stress out, all my COVID stress on this chair, and made an absolute mess of it. And I really wanna thank you all for joining me today. That is the complete destruction of a high-end piece of upholstery. And I appreciate the time. Thanks, everybody. John, any more questions? Alec, okay. thank you very much for this informative presentation. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, this uh, has been recorded and will be posted on our designer studio under the What's Important tab. And for those of you that aren't connected to us through our designer studio, you can certainly email us at marketing at centuryfurniture.com and we can pro provide the link for you. Um, until next time, be safe, be healthy, and remember, creativity connects. Bye now. Bye now.